Hello, Pin. Uh, hello, people. Um, this is going to be a video dedicated to uh, Marxism and more specifically the uh, Communist Manifesto. This has been a request from Pin, and I decided that since the first experience doing the video was uh, rather enjoyable. I would, you know, do it again and try to be a bit calmer with my movements so that the camera wouldn't move so much because I know that uh, it can be unpleasant even though nobody complained about it in, uh, in the comments yesterday. So maybe let's just, you know, um, cut to our topic. So, if we want to talk about the Communist Manifesto that Karl Marx released in, I think, uh, 1848 with uh, Engels, it's not really possible to start talking about it straight away. Like, we need to give a bit of context to that book and to how it came you know, to be so influential for uh, for communism until today, actually. I think, you know, in America, communism is kind of, well, it is a bad word. Like, it's, you'd be, some people would be suspicious, you know, of, uh, of other people who'd sort of call themselves communists. But you have to sort of be aware of the fact that in France, for example, if somebody says, I'm a communist, it's like, okay, well, you're a communist. It's a bit quaint, maybe. And some people, some left-wing people would hate me for sounding so uh, disparaging but you know in university where I went like a lot of people were wearing the CCCP you know USSR t-shirts so this is kind of what we're talking about but it's less influential of course these days particularly after the breakup of uh, Soviet Russia but the Communist Manifesto is still uh, a book that a lot of uh, people idealize I think the vast majority of people these days have not read it and they do not really know what Marxism is about. They sort of picture it as this kind of revolutionary left-wing movement, uh, forgetting in the process that actually Marxism, if you really look into the content of what it's about, is not revolutionary in that sense. It's actually a very calculated, prophetic it's, uh, it's very theoretical. It's a miracle in a way that Marx managed to, you know, have such an impact at a practical level. Um, and I have not looked into that side of his life because, you know, he was a very much a bourgeois intellectual. I mean, he had those radical ideas, but his impacts, I don't know, I don't know how he managed to have that because his writings are quite as you probably know, obscure in some respects, and like the terminology is difficult, the capital is a very difficult book to read. Perhaps the reason why he became so impactful and had a massive war historical role is precisely because of, thanks to books like the Communist Manifesto and other ones that are shorter and distill the essence of his philosophy of world history and class consciousness uh, in kind of concise and memorable fashion. Still, though, I mean, like, to read the Communist Manifesto at the time it came out, you'd have needed to be, like, fairly literate. So my, my impression, my feeling is that it became sort of the main targets. I mean, the main targets for the book were sort of maybe also bourgeois intellectuals, but who were closer to worker circles and more liable to influence them than Marx himself. So you'd had like Marx at the, and Engels at the top of the pyramid in London at the time and sort of basically influencing, like, so to speak, lower strata who are still conscious of their class belong, like belonging to the bourgeois class, uh, sort of hating that, wishing for solidarity with workers and promoting Marx's ideas with workers until uh, that kind of took hold. But keep, let's all keep in mind that the workers, I mean, were never the main force behind Marxism. The main forces were always bourgeois. And if you look at Lenin, Stalin, 
Trotsky, I mean, none of them are really workers. Uh, they influence them in the, in, in the long term. But the people who embraced Marx's ideas, who appreciated the Communist Manifesto and other books were usually uh, people who had the chance to have an education to even understand what I, those, those ideas. So what is the Communist Manifesto about? Well, it's a practical illustration of Marx's ideas for an audience that is, can be as wide as possible within limits as I already detailed. To understand what it's about, we need to go back in time a little bit to uh, what Marx's influences were. Before he developed his concepts of dialectical materialism, which is in essence what the Man Communist Manifesto exemplifies, he was a big disciple of Hegel, the philosopher Hegel, which you're probably familiar with, at least in name. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about Hegel's philosophy, this is not the topic, but the main contribution to philosophy that Hegel uh, made is his concept of the dialectic. The dialectic exists in a different philosophies, for example, the dialectic in, in so Socrates is his method of exchanging in conversation and debate with people asking them questions and making them realize that actually they don't really know what they're talking about. So someone comes to Socrates and says, I don't know, uh, I know what courage is about, courage is about this, that, uh, or I know what uh, piety is about, I know what morals are about, and Socrates asks questions and eventually makes them realize that they don't know anything about that. Hence the whole saying by Socrates, all I know is I know nothing, because dialectically you can always arrive at a point where you have to sort of admit that your knowledge is at best very superficial of any possible concept. And um, in the case of Hegel, dialectics means something completely different. What Hegel was trying to do was to uh, promote a whole different conception of the logic of reality. So it's a huge endeavor, massive process, probably what it appealed to Marx. Um, because, you know, both of them <laughs> were INTJs, so very long-term, very big picture, and essentially interested in revolution, like creating a little revolution of, uh, uh, about how we understand logic and development of the world. So Hegel was saying that the two are intri intricately linked. He was saying the logic, the typical laws of logic... Uh, the ones that everybody understands and takes for granted, are not the only laws that um, are there, exist. There may be alternative laws. Maybe some of the laws that we have been taken for granted are not the real laws. And they, our embrace of them are, is what prevents us from truly understanding the logic of reality. It's because our apparatus inside our own head has been... Um, biased, biased by centuries and millennia of uh, having the wrong kind of tools. And here, I mean, in case you've watched my other video about uh, my philosophical background, you'll see a parallel between Nietzsche and Hegel. Nietzsche was also saying, well, the way we've understood metaphysics is wrong by this focus on transcendence and essence. And Hegel was saying the way we understand reality with this focus on uh, different stages that with progress, etc., is also wrong. Um, and this really the INTJ ness here is very obvious because before they they have even sort of explained why they are making those broad claims, they've already had the vision of what they want to say. And this is very typical, I think, of NI users. I can see it in myself. Often I'm like, I know what I want to say and I know how it is different and I know how it sort of has been passed over in the past. But I sort of, I'm still not clear how I'm going to show it, you know. I think uh, other philosophers, you might call them INTP philosophers or just rational philosophers in general, they sort of really lead like their research piece by piece and they logically construct a model and then they see the results and they see what's kind of brought by the results. Often in the case of philo philosophers of insights, like Nietzsche and Hegel and Marx too, because Marx was uh, also INTJ actually. We're talking about INTJs uh, only here. Um, have the vision, and then they build what they think is the way there, the pattern that links their themselves and their vision, people and the sort of long-term outcome. 
And what Hegel was saying is that maybe the most fundamental logical law that everybody embraces is the law of negation. So if you have a particular statement, a particular situation, a state of affairs, and then it's negation, the result is zero. So you've got, let's say, the number one, the number minus one. Well, I mean, the addition of those two numbers is zero. And it's that applies to everything. So I make a statement, this uh, wallet, because actually my phone is, is on a wallet right now, and it's not full of Swiss money. Actually, there's very little in it. But this wallet is on, the, on, the, um, on a book. If I say this wallet is not on a book, well, I mean, this kind of disqualifies the whole, this wallet is on a book. Like the result is that this wallet is not on a book and it's like the, 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 the reality, the state of affairs saying this wallet is on a book is negated. Well, was, what Hegel was saying is that at a very abstract level, this, the dialectical logic is, is very different. It says that the thesis, so uh, this is X, for example, the antithesis, this is not X, when they meet, the result is not, um, the result is not, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like, I mean, the process of this negation, right? The process is there, the result is not nothingness, sorry, the, the result, the, the word I was looking for is nothing. In Hegel, in Hegel and this is, this is very important to Marx, this is why I'm going into Hegel a bit, nothing doesn't exist. Nothing is a creation of our own minds, a trap we fell into by assuming that we can actually even talk about nothing. But no, we can talk about nothing because in, 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 in so far as we say this is nothing, we're actually referring to a concept. In order to be able to say nothing, we are already referring to a certain particle of matter, okay? Which means that nothing is the name, it's, it's a name, right? Nothing is a word, we know what it means, but it does not refer exactly to what we think it refers to. It does not refer to uh, nothing precisely because we can't even capture that. So this kind of void that we picture is actually a substantial void. There's something about it. And what Hegel says is that it is the product of a thesis and an, ant an antithesis, logically speaking. So this is X, this is not X. But the product is not what we think is nothing. What he, what he says, the result is, is the synthesis, right? Which happens by the process of what he calls alpha bong. So the, the, the antithesis absorbs cancels the, not rather than absorbs, it cancels the thesis, but in the process, it absorbs it, and the result is like somehow a synthesis that is different from the thesis, from the synthesis, and yet in some way embraces both, both statements. So that what you get is a synthesis that contains both, this is not X and this is X. And Hegel says reality is always like this. We always have a state of affairs in which we have a possible this is X, a possible this is not X. The whole is different than both because either one sort of would negate each other. It contains both as some kind of unity uh, and resolves them in a sense. And the whole of Hegel's view of logic and the world with his reference to the evolution of different stages of the spirit is dialectical. It is like that. It is about a view of how in concrete matters of human history the world unfolds its movements is always dialectical. You have a thesis, you have an antithesis, a synthesis, and then the synthesis, so a particular period in, in history would be a, a thesis, say medieval, okay, like medieval ages. We could have gone way further back in time, but let's just say medieval times. You could say, well, maybe bourgeois society is the antithesis, and the synthesis would be, uh, well, I wouldn't say like, sorry, bourgeois society, because that would be further. You'd have medieval, like, uh, society with the lords, with, you know, all these people uh, and their serfs. And you could have the antithesis being sort of the world of commerce, merchants, eventually sort of taking power, creating bourgeois society, industrialism. And then the antithesis being, well, you could say whatever. You could say war as the outcome of uh, competing industrial societies and also industrial societies tending to you know, produce a lot of armaments by definition and, 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 and having a culture 
that worships those aesthetics of war. And the antithesis being war itself, destroying the war, creating the new postmodern society with human rights, uh, Europe, etc., etc. Well, Europe being, I mean, the union of countries. Think something that, which maybe without the antithesis of um, war between neighboring countries, leading to like millions and millions of deaths, the extermination of the Jews. Well, maybe without the antithesis, the synthesis of uh, countries uniting themselves into a European Union creating stronger bonds with, uh, with America, through NATO, uh, aiming for economic linkages, promoting human rights. Maybe that is like the synthesis of what happened in the past, because we're remembering it at the same time we're trying to go beyond it. This was kind of my interpretation, by the way, but this is kind of the vision that Hegel promotes. And you can really see how it could remain influential in the future, because there is a certain hope that in a sense, you can be an actor for change, but also you can benefit from the reassurance that the change is like, logically going to happen because it is inscribed in the very logic of the way the universe unfolds, including in its human incarnation in history of planet Earth. Um, so, okay, so this was a long introduction to Hegel, but hey, if this video can be an introduction to both Hegel and Marx, I mean, so much the better. Now... What does Marx add to that? Well, what Marx adds to that is, he says, Hegel is right about dialectics, but, oh, Jesus, his dialectics is so um, abstract. It's about spirit. It has that whole kind of mystical dimension. It's very hard to relate to, and it's useless, actually. Like, the dialectic, I mean, what's useless is not Hegelianism, but it's this idea that it's about this uh, mystical matter called spirit. Why don't we just say it's about here and now. Like, why don't we just say it's about what happens materially in front of us? And in this sense, Marx created this concept of dialectical materialism, as opposed to uh, Hegel's dialectical idealism, as we call it. Idealism, domain of ideas, domain of spirit, materialism, Marx, here and now, nothing else. Okay, so what Marx says is history does develop in different stages, but it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to understand how it develops in different stages. Actually, the, the thesis is a particular mode of production. The antithesis is another mode of production. And the synthesis is an, a yet new mode of production that contains both economically, culturally, because for Marx, economics and culture are very related, very connected. Culture tends to... Um, tends to legitimize the system of oppression that a particular mode of production embodies. Synthes synthesis into a new mode. So what Marx writes about in certain books that are very interesting and that, that are kind of a prelude to the concise distillation of his ideas in uh, the Communist Manifesto is the idea that you have the feudal economic system Okay. Eventually, f from its own contradictions, is, is, is negated by the commercial system, which produces a synthesis of oppression called the bourgeois system, in which the mode of production becomes incrementally capitalist, where, in a sense, the bourgeois are the new lords. They don't dominate the lower class uh, in their view, the lower class in the same way that the lords and the nobles used to dominate the serfs. The oppression is more subtle, it's economical, it's, uh, they exploit them, right? They, ex they exploit their capacity to produce value by having, they have a higher education and they control the means of production, the capitalist means of production, and they have people just in, the, in factories, you know, with the age of, uh, of industrialism sort of coming in, uh, factories just working for them. And the profit all goes to the, to the bourgeois, to the owners of the means of production. Means of production just means like the means of capitalist production. So they, they are the owners of factories. They are the owners of anything you like that workers work in. The workers are those who do the work and the, the owners are those who reap the benefits. And this is the society that Marx considers he lives in, and because he's a Hegelian in spirit, but from a materialist perspective, he 
he's trying to envision what the antithesis is and what the synthesis is going to be the next the next stages and I think that now you can really see how my detour into Hegelianism was useful because now you understand what the logic of Marx is. He thinks he is in living in a society of bourgeois oppression of workers and he is appalled by what he sees in factories, by the oppression of workers, by their terribly short lifespans, by the horrible diseases that they get but maybe even more horrified by the fact that in his view the bulk of the wealth is produced by the workers uh, not by the bourgeois the bourgeois just happen to be born in wealth and ownership they have property to begin with they have education so they just inherit things they get workers to work for them or they you know they create systems where workers work for them produce a certain profit the workers get you know like miserable wages live in poverty absolute poverty and while the bourgeois live in wealth. And what Marx says is that this is unbearable and that even, like, according to his vision, this is bound to crumble. This cannot last. But if he can contribute to accelerating the process by which it crumbles, that would be even better. And what Marx also believes in, and this is typically Marxist and no longer really dialectical, is that with the, the sort of spreading of his ideas, he can break the cycle of oppression so that if, if the bourgeois society crumbles because it is negated by, say, a workers' revolution, let's try to avoid having a synthesis that includes a further system of oppression and rather a classless society, communism. And what Marx essentially envisions is that the workers need to rebel against this system. This is what will happen, structurally speaking. Marx thinks he can accelerate it by publishing, by, by, by spreading the word. What we can say is creating a class consciousness in uh, workers, the proletariat. The proletariat is not a bad word. It's really the workers becoming worldwide because you also have the, the, the spread of the whole... I mean, you have globalization happening at that time as well, which is a product of capitalism. And by the whole Hegelian, Hegelian logic of the, of the synthesis containing its antithesis, the, the, the rebellion of the workers would benefit from this globalization because they could all be allied as well in rev like creating revolution and a dictatorship of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. They would benefit from globalization to ally with each other, whereas in the past, you just had like different pockets of, uh, of oppression with workers unable to relate to each other as similarly oppressed. And Marx wants to create this sense of class consciousness. The bourgeois are aware through their education, through relating to each other, through going to the same schools, through you know, just knowing each other. They have this consciousness. They know what they're doing. The workers are alienated by their work. They are so exhausted. They go to the factory, they work, it's back-breaking work, they produce, they, they, go, they go back home, they just no longer want to do anything. They don't have the time to just become aware of the class consciousness. And what Marx wants to do with the Communist Manifesto is to create this consciousness. Make the workers aware of the incredible force that they have together as, as a class. Make them aware that they're a class in the first place. They're not just like individualized, randomized uh, atomic units which is what the capitalist oppression wants them to, to believe or to just automatically just assume as a result of this constant sense of alienation. Alienation is a very important Marxist concept, uh, which is, is still influential in, in like neo-Marxism and uh, its variations today. The idea that work can be so, so awful and oppressive that it gives you a sense of just being disconnected from reality and making it very difficult for you to be aware of what's really going on in your life and being able to do anything about it, you know, and in broad terms. And so the Communist Manifesto is really a manifesto for the de-alienation of workers, for them to become aware of their existence as a real class, aware of the situation of world history and bourgeois oppression and what they are doing, and for workers to be aware of the fact that if they unite together, 
they actually are at a stage in the development of capitalism where 95 percent of the of the value of of uh of, of products that they you know that is contributed 95 percent of the value that capitalism thrives on is produced by the workers so if they can unite with each other if they can develop this awareness of themselves as a class they can overthrow the bourgeoisie who are by definition a very small number and in fact the way that wealth uh, tends to function is that it tends to be uh, accreting in the hands of a smaller and smaller few you know by being like by the system of uh, you know, buying off certain companies. Even today, we see that. You know, we see Jeff Bezos, you see uh, Mark Zuckerberg, just like those incredible, incredibly wealthy people. I mean, they are sort of becoming smaller and smaller in a sense, and the middle class is, is sort of becoming bigger and bigger and more impoverished. But that's beside the point for now. But this gives you an idea of what the neo-Marxists today would try to argue. But what Marx says is, since this is happening and this is inscribed in the very DNA of capitalism, capital tends to accumulate in the hands of a, of a few. But it also means that, like, as few individuals who, like, they're still walking in the street, you can overthrow them. You can, well, maybe not kill them, but you just, like, kidnap them or put them in prison or whatever. Because the, the, the people who are in control, of course, they have the influence of the state, the police, who kind of works with them. I think Marx was underestimating that, but... Um, there are still people, and there are fewer and fewer, and like the immense majority of workers, what they need really is to become aware of themselves as a class, and if they do that, they can sort of rebel against the owners of the means of production and create what he calls the dictatorship, the proletariat, which is seizing the means of production, which still exists, and if the, if, if the, if the uh, workers are able to organize themselves as a class and, and sort of educate themselves, because Marx is a humanist, he deeply believes that workers just are just as smart as bourgeois. They will know what to do with the means of production. They're not going to disappear. And this is the Hegelian synthesis at work. Like, the new system, the dictatorship of the proletariat, is not going to be a system in which the means of production of capitalism are erased, but they will be radically rethought so that they can benefit everybody. The wealth will continue to be created, um, but the Communist Manifesto really says the aim is a classless society. So instead of just the, the proletariat becoming like this newly empowered class who will in, 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 you know, in turn sort of get to have its own oppressed segment of society, its oppressed class, become the oppressor in turn, a little bit like maybe bourgeois or, com uh, you know, shop like um, what's the word like shopkeepers and merchants who used to be oppressed by the nobles became the bourgeois who oppressed the workers Marx wants to break that logic and say the synthesis will integrate the uh, the class consciousness of the proletariat it will integrate the means of production of the bourgeoisie and capitalism so you see the Hegelian synthesis logic at work here but at the same time it will aim, consciously aim, for a society in which wealth is redistributed. There is no profit. Uh, so complete state redistribution, collectivization, and people working according to what they want to do. So Marx, and here, I think, is where his message in the Communist Manifesto was the most influential, and also paradoxically probably the most illusory, is that it became very influential because it appealed to a lot of people to just have this like almost theological vision of a class class of society that could be achieved if workers united and people who didn't like the capitalist suppression who were bourgeois themselves because nobody is more appalled by bourgeois oppression than a bourgeois according to marx because they have the sense of guilt well the message of, of the manifesto appealed to them but at the same time it's also where the dialectical logic breaks because the class society is the last stage. There's nothing else after that. You know, uh, in philosophical terms, we call that a teleology, a vision, a purpose, which is fundamentally different than Hegel's. Hegel's is a teleology as well, but it unfolds by stages, and there's no, not necessarily any end to it. Whereas in Marx, there's a final resolution in the classless society, which each working according to what he wants to do. And this, in the manifesto, trust me, is very much announced like a messiah would announce it, but not very developed. So we get the sense that there will be the means of production, 
the proletariat will, because they have suffered oppression, they will know how to use them whilst in ensuring redistribution, uh, because that is the only way to have a humane society in which everybody thrives and the wealth will be enough. Um, but there's not a lot of technical discussion as to how that will be achieved in practice. And of course, the people who want to counter Marx will just say, well, it is in human nature to want to dominate and ac accumulate profit is a way for human creativity to be spurred, the, the vision of reward. And if everybody is equalized uh, artificially, that will just create um, a society that does not evolve, that becomes static and eventually just dies away. And, uh, you know, not to mention that the dictatorship of the proletariat in practice just became like state oppression to enforce collectivization uh, with all its abuses uh, in terms of totalitarianism, uh, well, totalitarian, totalitarianism of the USSR. So very, very distant from what Marx envisioned as a, a redistributive society where everybody wants to do what he wants to do. Um, but I think part of why it was so horribly disfigured in the USSR is precisely because that is the, the point where Marx wishes and wishful thinking undermines his the quality of his thought. The vision of the classless society is weak in Marx, but paradoxically in the manifesto, what was most appealing, because the most, you know, easiest to embrace, if you like. There you go, a bit long, but hopefully uh, you guys will enjoy this and let me know what you think. Let me know if this was useful. Let me know if Hegel and Marx are a little bit less obscure to you now and uh, let me know if you'd like me to talk about any, anybody else uh, for my next video. Ciao.